Good evening, everybody. How are we doing today? Awesome. You can respond. It's all right. Yay! Yay. Well, good. Not enough coffee. That's right. Uh, so glad to see everybody again. Um, I'm going to start us off tonight by reading uh, some verses from John chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 5. And it relates to the first song that we're going to sing. It says this, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The Word that John is talking about here is Jesus Himself. He was there at the beginning. You know, God spoke the world into existence, and Jesus stood there beside the Father. He was the Word. And then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the Word is the light, the light that shines in the darkness. And uh, Jesus is all of those things. He is, um, he's our Savior, he's our Rescuer. We're here to worship him tonight. And uh, the name of Jesus is powerful, it's beautiful. It's wonderful. So let's sing about that. I invite you to stand with me and sing What a Beautiful Name.
thankful that you guys are here. Thank you very much. Uh, we had a very uh, busy and eventful week. And uh, Nancy and Priscilla and I and uh, Drew and Nathan and Mark, you know, and all that are involved. We just really want to thank you guys uh, for the support that you've shown us. Uh, we celebrated uh, the beautiful life of Jeff on Tuesday, and it was incredible. It was incredible. And as a church, you know, we come around uh, a family, and I was talking with Jim. Jim has been to many military services, and he says that was one of the most memorable military services he can remember. And uh, it was really, really incredible. And though it was a hard time, uh, it was also a time that we could be true to the goodness of God. And uh, it was incredible to see uh, the hope that we could share uh, in the fact that, that Jeff knew Jesus and that we know Jesus. And though it's difficult, uh, we don't mourn like those without hope. And, uh, and that was really incredible. But as a church family, our job's not done. We still are loving on Nancy and Priscilla, and uh, though Nancy just got done hosting a huge amount of people at her church, uh, uh, I mean, at, at her home this week, so we're going to give them a little bit of time to catch up and, and rest, but we also know that this is also kind of the calm after the storm, and it can be difficult, so, you know, if you guys want to grab coffee with uh, Priscilla and Nancy, it's a great place to do it. Uh, the, the, the coffee shop's now open Monday through Saturday, so we're excited about that, but Thank you very much for all that came and supported on Tuesday and, and been helping out. Throughout. Yeah, Nancy and Priscilla really appreciate it. And we do as a staff. And one of the biggest we, we can feel it as a staff is your prayers. Your prayers. I mean, Drew and Mark did an incredible job with music. And, uh, you know, there are people from all around the world that thank Nathan and his ability to put the service online. That was really, really cool. And there's people all over the world that were really thankful. So, Nathan, thank you for doing that. It's really, really cool. So. Um, let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for the gift that you've given us of family. And in this family, God, you've given us different abilities, uh, like Nathan being able to do this online, and, and Drew and the music, Lord. And we just thank you so much for the coffee shop and this space to gather. And Lord, we just faithfully come to you as our Father, and we are your children. And we're worshiping you tonight in the Depot Plaza, which is awesome. We love doing it around the, the, the bustle of a busy parking lot on a beautiful August night. We love you, God. We put full faith and hope and trust in you as we move forward with coffee shop services and Waterville services and mountaintop services. And what does this look like after Columbus Day when we come off the mountain? And we just, we just trust you, Lord. And we ask that the doors would be uh, uh, open to us, that we would follow your Holy Spirit. And uh, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Sing me
This is like 8.5 miles, something like 4,000 vertical. Huge. You know, it's it's a, a big one. So um, we're super excited. If you want to sign up or you have kids that want to sign up specifically, don't have the adults sign up. But uh, if the kids want to do it, come talk to me. Um, we can I can show you where to uh, get registered online. Um, there's not going to be a cutoff on that registration, um, but it's a free event. And come hang out. It's going to be a blast. It's going to really challenge all of us because it's a long, long hike. But you know what? What's cool about getting challenged like that is you often uh, you often grow the most from those challenges. So, anyways, middle school, high school hike, and then. Uh, yeah, and then we're going to be doing kind of some informal thing when we get to Camp Berea next week. So that's going to go right into Camp Berea. We're super excited about that every year. I think Drew, Drew chatted about it a little bit last week, but every year Camp Berea is probably one of my favorite uh, things that we get to do as a church because I learn more about the people who come to that than I do about most of our church members the entire year hanging out on a Sunday morning. Um, so it's really, really a great time to just rest and, and be encouraged by one another being there together. So uh, that's going to be, it's a, it's a camp out in Maine that Marcus's his family, I don't even know where they found it or how they do it, but um, it's really cool, it's free. <laughs> yeah, I know. Was it, was it your grandpa who came up with, or who like, he who helped found it. He helped found it, okay. Anyways, we get to go out there as a church. Um, and uh, it's next Sunday, Monday, and we all leave on Tuesday. Now, you can come for as little of that as you'd like or as much of that as you'd like. And uh, I think basically you just cover food. I don't know if Marcus, maybe Marcus will tell you any more if, if I've missed it, which I probably missed a lot. Um, Waterville service happened last weekend. That was another huge success, I think, with even bigger uh, group than the previous uh, the previous month, so we're super excited at the momentum that God is doing there. If you want to be a part of the next Waterville service, that is uh, September 13th, and then we have one following that on October 11th. So really, really cool at Snow's Mountain down in Waterville Valley, and it overlooks Waterville Ski Resort. Uh, as Marcus just said, the coffee shop, that's the big news. I actually just found out about this when Marcus said it. Um, so I guess it's open from Monday through Saturday now. Okay. Normal hours of on course of 10 to 530. Um, yeah. That, yeah, that's pretty much about it from that. Um, am I missing anything in regards to the coffee shop? Come early, come often. Looking at my wife. Okay. All right. Come early, come often. Um, coming up, uh, the first weekend, the first Saturday of October is our 30th year anniversary as being a ministry, uh, back when Skip and Joyce came here. That's going to be a really fun, just huge barbecue we're going to throw. That is Saturday, October 3rd at the Cape Rec Center. Um, I would, I would talk to Marcus if you have some questions about what that all looks like, but it'll be really, really fun. Um, you know, as I kind of mentioned... You know, what's on this piece of paper is not all we do. Um, you know, we are the body of Christ throughout the week, and that's what missional communities is all about. It's not just about coming in on a Sunday morning, or I guess Saturday night now, um, and, and doing our thing here. Like, we are walking as Christ's body throughout the week in our town, who we hang out with, and so um, that's what missional community is all about. Drew's missional community, Drew and Trisha's missional community meets on Tuesday nights. Um, and, uh, and that's a cool way of getting to do that, but same thing. We could easily get tied down to a Tuesday night, and that'll be it, and that'll kind of miss the point as well. So, um, you know, that's the idea behind what missional communities do. And whatever you guys are doing in your homes, whoever you're hanging around, around with, use that time to be intentional, to learn God's Word, and to, and to encourage and, and be thoughtful and caring to one another. Uh, but also, don't just sit inside and be a, a holy huddle. Go, go be God's hands and feet in this wonderful community we have. So um, if you want to support us, you can, we do have, we do have the box out. Um, you can give uh, with a check or cash um, in the donation box, or you can give online at loonmtnministry.com. Um, thank you guys all for being here, and I think that's about it. All right, we're going to sing one more song before we dismiss the kids.
all creatures of our God and King. have supported those who are fallen. You encourage those with shaky knees. But now when trouble strikes, you lose heart. You are terrified when it touches you. 
Does that make a reference to God give you confidence? Does it your life give of integrity give you hope? This truth was given to me in secret, as though it whispered in my ear. It came to me in a disturbing vision at night when people are in deep sleep. How much less will he trust people made of clay? They are made of dust, crushed as easily as a mob. They are alive in the morning, but dead in the evening, and gone forever without a trace. I was reading a book by A.W. Tozer this week, and uh, he said in that uh, God breathes on clay, and it becomes man. And then when he breathes on man, it becomes clay again. I thought that was pretty awesome. Wow. That's really good. That's really good. Thank you, Bill. All right, you really can be seated this time. Um, before we get going on Joel... Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Camp Berea, like uh, Nathan said. I, I'm getting a little nervous that uh, people are like, I don't know if I want to go to Camp Berea. It's where the pastoral staff goes to know people. <laughs> but uh, it's a really good time uh, to hang out, and it is a chance for us to get to know you a little bit better. Uh, I will say that it's a place where you can be whatever it is that, you know, whether you want to grab a basketball and play that or play bocce ball, sit on the beach, go for a swim, uh, jump in the boat. Uh, you know, read a book in a hammock, there is a spot for you to do whatever, and I try to tend to do one of each of those over the two days that I'm there, which is a lot of fun, and uh, if you are a hammocker, there are some phenomenal hammocking trees there, and I tend to bring my hammock and a book, and I get lost in there, which is, is a lot of fun, but uh, we have chose to go through the book of Job uh, because we are young as a staff, and we would like wisdom. Uh, we've talked about this a bunch. Uh, I feel like I should be speaking like this because of our online people, good. but Just keep talking. we're good. That's why we turn it. Okay. Uh, but anyway, um, the book of Job is one of the books of lit uh, wisdom literature in, in Scripture. And I was thinking about um, the story of Camp Berea. So we're going over to Camp Berea, which I believe is around 60 years old. And uh, my grandfather was part of a team. Uh, it was a pastor and a couple of farmers who helped start Camp Berea. Because in the time, this is Camp Berea, Maine. This is Camp Berea, New Hampshire. So don't confuse the two. It's Camp Berea, Maine. Uh, at the time, uh, Christian camping in Maine was, was pretty large. Uh, camping across the world actually started in Maine. Uh, summer camps for kids and boys uh, in particular started in New England uh, long ago. Like Church Island on Squam Lake was a boys camp in the early 1900s. So uh, camping in general started in New England. But at the time, 60 years ago, there, the camps were mostly for little kids, but it wasn't really a place for a teenager to go and learn about God's word and have a unique experience where they can you know, dive into God's word. And, and so my uh, grandfather's uh, pastor was, was very passionate about this. The pastor was also, I believe, a superintendent of a small Christian school where my father ended up going uh, and where he met my mother, uh, which was cool. But this, this, this superintendent slash pastor was very serious about a, a Christian camp. And this is why I think it's incredible, and this is why I bring up this story, is because I look around our uh, staff, and our good buddy Drew over here turned 30 yesterday. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you can feel it in that. And, uh, you know, and I'm 38, and, and Nathan's, you know, coming up on 30, and, and, and I look youngest. around. Youngest. Yeah, we're young. We're, we're young. <laughs> But when I think about this story, this is what I think is incredible about this story and the faith of my grandfather. Uh, so we're young, and I think we have a lot of light, and God's given us a lot of vision and excitement. But wisdom is something that we need. So we're in the book of wisdom right now, uh, both Proverbs we're going to cover later. Job we're jumping into right now, and Ecclesiastes will come up later too. Um, but my grandfather was a young farmer. He had gotten out of the military, and in 1947 bought a small farm in East Wilton, Maine. Became uh, involved in the church there in East Wilton, Maine. Uh, became an elder pretty quickly, and, and he was a pretty young guy, you know, in that, that time. And that pastor there wanted to start a Christian camp for teenagers. And this is one of the things incredible about my grandfather. Here was my grandfather with a young farm. His parents did not help him with the purchase of that farm. He'd come back from the military. He had married my grandmother, Vera, and they'd had a couple boys already. And uh, so um, they had a couple they had a couple boys already. And so here he is, young farmer, two young boys. I'm sure it was pretty scary to make your payments every month on this large land and, and milking cows and my grandmother helping along by planting in the garden. And this pastor comes along and says, hey, we really would like to do this Christian camp for teens, 
but we're lacking the finances. And here's what my grandfather did in faith. He said, I will put our farm up for collateral to buy the Christian camp. Is that crazy? I mean, think about that. This is a young 30, you know, young, late 20s, early 30s. Got two boys, maybe even one on the way. They end up having five boys. It goes Ray, Ron, Richard, Randy, Rodney. And every single one of them was supposed to be Rachel. <laughs> so actually some of them, she let their hair grow out really long. And as they were like three, four-year-old boys, and sometimes we call her Rachel. But anyway, uh, my dad is the second oldest of that crew. But, but, but a young farmer in my grandfather put his farm up for collateral. And I just think that is absolutely beautiful. And, and so anyway, six years now, you know, I feel very, very fortunate to be a grandson of my, of my grandfather. And our church that I'm a part of is going to go over and be built up in relationships, built up in love, and in following the Lord. And I just, I mean, I mean, get goosebumps talking about it. It's really, really cool to be a part of that. So we're a young group, and we're looking to, to the Lord to give us some wisdom. So... Book of Job, here we go. The Book of Job is not a really fun read. It is not fun at all. It, uh, it, it you know, it's, it's, it's called Wisdom Literature. It's the uh, historians and theologians say that it's the oldest book uh, in the Bible. And uh, I think it's really cool that it's the oldest book in the Bible because it actually goes after some of the hardest questions. Why do bad things happen? Why is there suffering? Why do bad things happen to good people? And we've been covering that uh, uh, you know, over the last couple of months uh, uh, with this book of Job. So, as you know, the book of Job starts out with a meeting between God and, and, and his angelical host. In comes the accuser named Satan. Satan's been walking to and fro along the earth. God brags on Job, and this is what's difficult about this. God brags on Job and says, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him on earth. He's righteous, and everything he does is incredible. Satan totally is like, yeah, if you took away everything that you've done for him good, he'll curse you to your face. God takes him up on the bet and says, okay, you can, you can, you can do whatever you want to him except for you, can't hurt, you know, can't hurt him personally. You can take all of his wealth. You can take his loved ones from him. You can take all that from him, but you can't hurt him personally. And so Satan goes out, takes his children, takes his houses, takes all of his livestock, all of his investment, his business. Job is down for the count. At the end of at chapter 1, the famous saying is, God, you've given and you've taken away, but I will still choose to say, blessed be your name. He said, naked I came into the world and naked I'll leave, but I'll still praise the Lord. That's the end of chapter 1. Chapter 2 starts out the same way. They're having a staff meeting up in heaven. The accuser <laughs> comes in. God says, hey, how about Job? He's doing pretty good, even after you did all that to him. Job said, yeah, you can take away someone's wealth and someone's kids, but you know what? You take away their health, and they'll definitely curse you. God says, all right, you're on. Take his health, you just can't take his life. Satan goes out and just destroys this man's health, right? To the point where his actual wife in verse two, uh, chapter 2 says, you should just curse God and die. Get this over with. And he looks at his wife and says, are you foolish? Are you crazy? We can't take what is hard from the Lord. Or like well, he said, we can't take what's good from the Lord and deny what's hard from the Lord. Meaning we can't only just have good gifts from God and not take the others that come with it. And then he hit, hit the ground and said, I will still worship you, which is pretty, pretty crazy. Then you see this really crazy moment where his friends hear about this, you know, this, this rough time, and they show up, three of them show up. And what's incredible is we did a sermon about this, is what to do when a friend is suffering. And you learn from them in the end of chapter 2, they literally come in, right? They literally come in, and they don't speak for seven days. Seven days they don't speak. I haven't spoke for like, I, I don't know, I, I can't go seven minutes. They went <laughs> seven days, right? And they covered themselves with ashes, tore their clothes, and they just laid in Job's sorrow and in his, and in his you know. And then what we talked about is a good friend enters into sorrow. And you learned it from Ananias with Saul on the road where Saul became Paul. And you enter, you lay hands on someone, you call them brother, sister, you pray for them, and you just enter in and learn what a good friend does during a time of suffering. Well, the friends didn't stay there long, and chapter 3 uh, happens. 
chapter 3 is after seven days. Job breaks the silence. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. And Job essentially says, I wish I was never born. Right? I wish that you know, you'd curse today. And we, and we talked about how, um, and how suffering, essentially, we, we've got a wrong theological view, or we've got a wrong view of God and his word, if we think that suffering shouldn't happen to good people. Or we think we come to God so that suffering goes away. And we learned from Nathan last week that if we believe Jesus and Christianity and God is just an add-on to our lives that are somehow supposed to make this life just better, and that's the whole point of it, we'll get really frustrated really quickly uh, because we'll see in Scripture many times that uh, trials, tribulations, afflictions, turmoil come to those who believe in Jesus, come to those who are called sons of God. And we see it right from the beginning that it doesn't happen uh, necessarily because of your sin or because you've been a bad person. The book of Job starts out with, and Job was a righteous man, none like him on earth, and God allowed evil to come to him. Right, so that throws that out right there. Now, so he laments this big lament, Job does chapter 3. We talked about that, and we said, no, God created good. It was our decision to, uh, to seize authority. We said we are going to take authority, right? And then when we took authority, that came consequences. Sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all humanity, the book of Romans says. When that happens, consequences happen, and suffering entered the world. We are currently in a time of suffering. God did not leave us there, but he sent Jesus to enter our suffering, took on the fullness of a human, lived a perfect life, took on the sacrifice of God's wrath and our sin, saving us from God's wrath, from our sinful state, and allowing us to be part of God's holy presence, which is going to be glory. And Paul says, I consider it, these present sufferings, very minuscule compared to the glory that is to come. And that is the Christian faith. There's nothing else different. I mean, you, 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 a lot of times we as Christians, we want to try to make up our own thing in our own way, right? But the Christian faith is that we were created good, our decision brought about bad, evil entered the world, death by sin, suffering is our current state, but there's still beautiful things out there. Sunsets remind us of God's goodness. Baby's laughter reminds us of God's goodness. Baby's crying reminds us that we're still in time of suffering, right? <laughs> suffering. And then, you know, and then the Christian perspective is that God is in control. He's on his throne. There has not been a time where he is out of control. And that glory, glory is to those who believe in the Christ, into Jesus through faith. Um, and then that there's eternity of glory. Right? That's the Christian perspective. Now, we're going to learn today from chapter 4. That was the quick review of chapter 1, 2, and 3. I probably shouldn't be doing that every week, so hopefully this is a crew and online that I can just say, hey, hopefully you've read chapter 1, 2, and 3, you know where we're at. Here's chapter 4. Essentially now we're going to get into this long poem of Job says something, and then a friend replies. And then Job says something, and then a friend replies. And we're going to do this for the next 30-something chapters. Now, I promise we are not going to cover those every day. Or every Sunday, I, I couldn't. We're gonna just we're gonna we're gonna capture them. The next thirty verse, the next thirty chapters, we'll capture over probably the next two or three weeks, and then we'll move on to God shows up at the end and has this pretty incredible you know ending to this book with God giving a tour of the world to Job. He kind of creates an IMAX theater for Job and takes him around the world, which would have been incredible, scary, but incredible. But right now we're gonna look at what not to do. How not to respond to a friend who's in suffering. And this is our first friend. Uh, Bill, you've got your scriptures open. What was the name of this friend in chapter 4? I can't remember. Which one was this guy? Can someone remind me? Or maybe someone had their Bible. What's the name? There's three friends. Bildad. This is Bildad? The first one's Bildad? Bildad the shoe. A shoe Gotcha. Yeah, the little guy. He's as tall as a shoe. The Bildad the shoe height. He's the shortest man in the Bible, right, Bill? That's right. Yeah. So this is his, this is his first response, and, and here's some things I took away what not to do when a friend is suffering, okay? First, don't be a mirror, meaning don't just come in like this guy, right, is coming in, and it's essentially don't just state the obvious, like, wow, you look awful, 
Right? Like, that's not a, like, that's not a great way to enter into a room and be like, wow, you look awful. And then the other thing was, you know, he's, th- he's doing this, like, being in the mirror. Hey, you had all this faith. Now you've got none. What's wrong with you? Don't, don't, don't you know who you, you know? Like, th- that's not helpful. Right? Oh, yeah, Isla. The, uh, we got an escapee. Um, listen, we're not to be a mirror for people. We're not to just sit there and point out the zit or point out the thing in their lives, right? The Bible says that the Bible is a mirror. The book of James says, he who is wise uses the word of God like a mirror. They look at themselves in the morning in the mirror, right? And they examine where they are based upon God's word. You don't have to be God's word. And I think sometimes we as Christians, we forget that. We think we have to be God's word, or we have to, and I watch it so many times, even in my own life. It's so difficult when someone's suffering, you want to just fix it, right? Well, I'm a husband, you know? Wives, do you like it when your husband tries to fix you? No, you're not a car, right? When our friends are suffering, they're not cars. They're, they're human beings. Okay, And it is good to know God's word, and it is good to share God's word with them. But we are, we are not to be God's word. We are just to be in God's word and to be lovers of the word and doers of the word, and not hearers only, the book of James says. But we have to be very careful to not use God's word as a, as a battering ram. You know, as you need this and I know what you need. And a lot of times I think that like Christians... We, we, we tend to come to Christianity because we can be an expert at something, right? We, 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 in the rest of the world, we haven't been an expert in the business realm. We may not have been an expert in the educational realm or the sports realm. So we become excellent Christians. And that leads me to my next point, right? When you're suffering, when your friend is suffering, you don't need an expert, it's not fun when a friend comes to you and, and is an expert. So the first thing is don't be a mirror. And that's what this guy says. He says, listen, he says, but now when trouble strikes you, you lose heart. You are terrified when it touches you. Don't you reverence, have reverence for God? Don't you have confidence in God? Doesn't your life of integrity give you hope? The next one is, that's the mirror. The next one is, don't be an expert. This, is, this, this would annoy me if this was my friend that said this. Listen, this is, he thinks he's pretty awesome. This is what he says. This truth, this is what he's telling Job, who's laying there in boils, in sores. The, it, literally, the Bible says they couldn't recognize him. He was so bad off physically. And this is what his friend says. The truth was given to me in secret, as though whispered in my ear. Don't be an expert. I don't know how many times I've been in a rough place or I've been having troubles and someone's quoted scripture to me as if they were some expert. And I'm like, oh my, like, you just, who are you there for, right? We did, uh, Drew and I took an ethics class a couple weeks ago and one of the things that the ethics class said, listen, pastors, you must always ask yourself before a sermon. You must always ask yourself before counseling. You must always ask yourself before walking into bedside, who are you there for? Are you there to be needed? Are you there because you need my knowledge? I went to Bible school for four years and paid $120,000. You need to listen to me. You know? Well, what are you there for? Because if you're not there for God, which ultimately puts you there for the other, you then go sell cell phones, right? Or go sell real estate. If you're there for you, you're not following the lead of, of the Spirit. You're not following the lead, you know. And I just say that to myself. I've said that to myself a lot. Like, if I wasn't doing this, I need to do this for others. If I wasn't doing this, I would go sell cell phones. Or, as my father would say, I'm going to go sell ketchup popsicles to white glove ladies. That's, I don't know, a saying, I guess. Or ice to Eskimos. I'm going to sell ice to Eskimos. They say I'm good at selling, so I don't know. But my prayer is that by the work of the Holy Spirit in my life, 
that God can use the education that he's given me. God can use the word that I've hid in my heart or that my mom made me memorize. Remember we talked about that? My mom would make me memorize scripture or I'd have to listen to Christian music until I spouted off all my verses. Then she'd let me listen to Oldie Station. Remember that? I had to listen to Steve Green until I could tell all my Bible verses and then I could listen to John Fogarty. She hammered it into your head before it was hit in Yes, she did. <laughs> Drew just said she hammered it into my head before it was hit in my heart. And I felt it. Um, but I'm so thankful that she did because there's so many times now where I'm holding the hand of somebody at the bedside. There's so many times now where I am just met abruptly with something and they're asking for, for hope. And I don't want to give my own hope. I want to give God's hope from his scripture. And I'm able to bring that. You know, I, I, you know, at Jeff's service, I'm able to go off of no notes, which you need because you're, you know, you're outside now. Who would have ever predicted that I would have, that we'd have to do a, a service without sound system and with people standing 6 to 10 to 12 feet apart? Right? I mean, the closest person, I mean, the furthest away person was probably, I don't know, 60 yards. And so you had to project. And, and God is good to me and has given me, and given me verses to memorize and to share with people. However, I must be very careful. I'm speaking to me tonight. I'm speaking to me tonight. And you just happen to get to sit in and listen to me talk to myself. They say talking to yourself is a sign of genius. So, yes, I'm a genius. But, don't, Marcus, don't be an expert. Give God's word out of love. Give God's word out of being there for them i got to check my motives. And if I was to word it like this guy, this truth was given to me in secret, as though whispered in my ear. It came to me in a disturbing vision at night when people are in a deep sleep. He's making himself sound awesome, like I'm somebody important and you need to listen to me. wrong not a good way to go about it. Not a good way at all. So don't be a mirror. Don't be an expert. So I don't want to just tell you what not to do. I want to give you some examples from Scripture of what are some good friends in Scripture. Two, two, two people that I thought of that were good friends in Scripture uh, was David and Jonathan. So I, I looked up David and Jonathan and um, what, what, would, what would be an example of a good friend. Uh, as you know, uh, David was, was, was chosen by God to be the next king of Israel. Saul was the current king of Israel. Jonathan was Saul's son. Saul really wanted Jonathan to be king. And so because of that, um, Saul was going after David to kill him. So, so Saul is tracking down David to kill him. And here's an interaction between Jonathan and David, and here, I think, is a good way to be a friend. David's in a rough place. He's being tracked down by the king of Israel to be killed. That's a, that's a, that's a tough day at the office. That's, that's a rough day, okay? And here's what Jonathan, a good friend, comes and says in 1 Samuel 23, 15 through 18. One day near Horish, David received the news that Saul was on his way from Ziph, to search for him and kill him. Rough day. Jonathan went to find David and encouraged him to stay strong in his faith. Stay strong in his faith in God. Do not be afraid, Jonathan reassured him. My father will never find you. You are going to be the king of Israel and I will be next to you as my father Saul is well aware. So the two of them renewed their solemn pact before the Lord. Then Jonathan returned home. While David stayed in Horish. That's a good friend. That's a good friend. A good friend makes a pack, a solemn pack before the, for the, before the Lord. I will love you and I will stand by you through thick or thin. Jonathan was risking his life being a friend of David. Jonathan was saying, I love you. And you know what ultimately happened? Jonathan lost his life actually because of his love for David. That's actually what happened. That's a true friend. Another friend that I thought was really cool uh, was Naomi to her, um, to her mother-in-law, Ruth, in the book of Ruth. And I really love these verses. And uh, sometimes when I do weddings, we'll use these verses. I think these are really cool. And I like sometimes when I read them like 
in an old accent like Gladiator. It sounds really awesome. <laughs> but Ruth chapter 1, verses 16 through 17, um, you know, uh, Naomi was the mother and Ruth was the daughter-in-law. And, and Naomi had lost her husband and Ruth had lost her husband too. And the other gal had lost her husband. So you had two daughters-in-laws and a mother-in-law who'd lost all of their husbands. And back then that was a big deal because that's who would provide for them. And that's who you'd have your land with. So you not only lost your your, your ability to get to, to have money, you also lost your um, housing as well. And so this was a pretty tough situation. And Naomi was an older gal, and so she didn't have anything. And back then they didn't have nursing homes or 401ks or, or social security. You're just out of luck, right? And uh, Ruth knew that, and Ruth did not want to leave Naomi. And here's what she says uh, to Naomi. Ruth replied, this is pretty cool, Don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Where you go, I will go. Where you live, I will live. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. That's a pretty good friend right there. Right? Ruth is probably young and attractive. She could probably go out and find another man. But her mother-in-law's baggage, it's an old lady she's got to cart around here and take care of, right? But that's incredible. In the face of adversity, Ruth says, I will be true to you. What I think is incredible about this story is in Ruth's faithfulness to her mother-in-law, Naomi, Ruth finds the true God. What you don't know is earlier, in a couple verses earlier, the other sister-in-law left Ruth. And it said, literally, she went back to her land and her gods. And it was little g gods. And Ruth said, your God will be my God in this, these verses. And God is capitalized. Meaning Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Yahweh. Right? The beginning and the end. Alpha and Omega. So here's Ruth in her faithfulness to Naomi, which looks like a dire situation. And how this played out, it played out a lot better for Ruth than it did for Jonathan. And that's why I want to see the Bible gives different examples. Jonathan was a great friend to David, very faithful and true. Jonathan lost his life. Ruth was a beautiful friend to her mother-in-law, Naomi, very faithful and true in the, in, in the face of adversity. It worked out great for Ruth. She ended up marrying what the Bible calls the kinsman redeemer which is actually a, a foreshadowing of our Redeemer, Jesus. His name was Boaz. He was super rich. And he took care of Naomi and Ruth. Worked out great. You've got to be careful when you use God's word, though. Right? Because if you read Ruth's story, you're like, there. If I'm faithful in my friendships, when my friends are suffering, it will come back to me. Uh, that's not Christianity. That's Buddhism. It's called karma. That's a belief. Not Christianity. It's not part of Scripture. Jonathan was an incredible friend. An incredible friend to David. And he lost his life. But there's no better example of a friend than Jesus. Right? We learn what it means to not be a great friend, and that's to be a mirror, point out the zit. Hey, you look awful. Right? It also isn't great to be an expert. I know what you need, and I'm going to tell you. Right? You don't need that. We learned about good friendship than Jonathan and Ruth. Now let's look at Jesus. To be a really, really good friend when your friend is suffering is to put yourself in their shoes. Compassion is never achieved until you actually walk in the shoes of the one that you're trying to be compassionate on. Forgiveness is never possible until you put yourself in the shoes of whoever you're trying to forgive. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Paul writes this about Jesus in 2 Corinthians 5.21. And you've got to get this because this is the gospel. The only way Jesus was able to save us, the only way Jesus was able to forgive us, the only way God was able to forgive us, and I just said it, is was to put himself in our shoes. And here's what Paul says about Jesus in 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him. Made. That's command. That's like go. 
God made him who knew no sin to become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. Let me say that again. God made him who knew no sin to become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. That is how to be a true friend. This friend of Job's here may have started off in a good effort, put himself in Job's shoes, and laid there next to Job for seven days without saying anything, and covered himself in sackcloth and ashes. That's a great start. But obviously he got full of himself, and he got impatient. And after Job spoke, he lost his grace, lost his patience, became a mirror, and became an expert. And you know what's awful about this guy becoming an expert? He was not good theologically. He wasn't. I have found that when I try to become an expert, nine times out of ten, that's when I make a mistake. Nine times out of ten, when I become the expert, is when I go down a road that's no good. That's exactly what this friend did when he became this expert and said, it was whispered to me. And it says, it came to me in a disturbing vision at night when people are all so deep asleep, meaning, feel bad for me. I had to stay up. As if Job's going to feel bad for him. He lost all of his kids and all of his wealth and his health and his wife's cursing at him. <laughs> Good luck, pal. Oh, I didn't get some sleep last night. He goes, how much less will he trust people made of clay? They are made of dust, crushed as easy as a moth. They are alive in the morning, but dead by the evening, gone forever. Essentially what this friend is saying, Job, I know God, and God doesn't allow evil to come to good people. You must have done something wrong. Well, apparently this friend didn't read the first chapter of Job. Because Job, God himself, said had done nothing wrong. This friend was way off. But poor Job doesn't know that. Right? And this friend doesn't know that. They don't know what God's doing behind the scenes. And that's the whole point of Job. The whole point of Job is this. God's the author you're not. So stop fighting over the pen. Let me say that again. The whole point of Job is God's the author. You're not. Stop fighting over the pen. We've learned all those kind of things, but that's the main point. And the main point today from Job chapter 4 is how not to be a good friend. Right? Don't be a mirror. Don't point out the zit. Don't say, what's wrong with you, right? You look awful, right? And then also, don't become this expert, because when you become an expert, you usually make it way worse. Do what Jonathan did, and that's give your life for a friend. Do what Ruth did, and that is completely abandon your, your path of, or, or, or your comfort for a friend. And do, do what Jesus did. That's actually enter into your friend's shoes. So that's our prayer. God's teaching that to me, right? My job as the executive director of the ministry, the senior pastor, is to lead you. So what I'm taking from tonight's scripture is, Marcus, don't just be a mirror, point out people's problems. Don't be an expert, Marcus, right? You might think you got your Bible degree and wrote, you know, raised in a family. You always hear me say, I was born on Saturday in church on Sunday. My dad was the pastor and my mom was the organ player. Those are all true. But the moment I try to become an expert is where things go downhill. What we've learned from, the, from Ruth, what we've learned from Jonathan, and what we've learned from Jesus is that the greatest friend lays down their life for another. And that's what he's calling me to do here leading this church. It's what he's calling you to do leading your home, leading your business, leading your neighbors. Leading whatever you're leading is to lay down your life. And you know what, Americans? <laughs> Sometimes laying down your physical life would actually be easier than what God's calling you to do. For me personally right now, I do not like wearing masks. I think it's ridiculous. I think I, we all look ridiculous, right? But here's the thing. It's what's going on right now, Okay. And, 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 and I don't understand the science behind it because I'm not a scientist, okay? So I'm not going to about ready to get into that debate because remember I told you when you become an expert, you look ridiculous. I'm not an expert when it comes to science. But what I do know 
is that there, that, that there are times to wear the mask out of love. Right? When you can't maintain you know, spatial distance and there's folks that really want to wear masks, am I going to love them or not? Am I going to sit there and have some debate with them about science? I can't. I don't know anything about science. Let's, let's be real. And so I put the mask on and I realized I have horrible breath. I have never eaten more mints and gum than 2020 because I feel horrible that you've all had to be living with me this long. Why didn't someone tell me? Ooh, it's awful. We have. Oh, yes. Sorry. Drew has. He has told me. My breath is horrible, especially when I've been drinking coffee. But that's the thing. So right now, it, it, it might mean putting a mask on when you don't want to and loving on somebody. It, 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 might, it might mean staying up late. It might mean leaving out of something early. It might mean listening. I'm a horrible listener, but I'm working on it. Love, love is to lay down one's life for another, as Jesus Christ did. That's what the book of 1 John says. So we've learned tonight how not to be a friend. Don't be a mirror. Don't be an expert. We learned how to be a friend from Jesus, Ruth, and Jonathan. Put yourself in your friend's shoes while they're suffering. Jesus, we love you. We thank you that you put yourself in our shoes, that you came and you learned what it's like to have a backache and a headache. You learn what it's like to be tempted uh, by a flesh that wants to do what's wrong. Lord, you learn everything about us. And in so doing, you maintain perfect. You maintain spotless. And like a lamb, you went to slaughter to take the wrath of God upon yourself and the sins of the world upon yourself. Man, you are a good God. You are a good Savior, Jesus. And we thank you. By the power of your Holy Spirit, fill us so that we can be good friends. That we won't become mirrors or experts. That we, we put ourselves through compassion in other people's shoes. God, give us that ability. Lord, we can't forgive. We cannot forgive until we admit that I, I, I can forgive because I've said stupid things before. I know they said something stupid about me, but man, if I don't forgive them, there's going to be a lot of people behind them that can't forgive me about the stupid things I said. Lord, if I don't forgive this person for cutting me off, how do I ever hope to be forgiven by all the people I've cut off? And the list goes on and on. Jesus, help us by the Holy Spirit to put ourselves in the shoes of those who are suffering, in the shoes of those who we need to forgive, in the shoes of those who we need to help. We love you, Jesus. Guide us by your Spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to close with uh, how great thou art.
said, greater love has no man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. He laid down his life for us, and he calls us to lay down our lives for others. Hope that's what you heard tonight, because that is the good news of the gospel. And, uh, that's what we are all about. So, you guys, as you know, are welcome to hang out. We're going to be here finishing coffee and goodies. So glad you could worship with us today. Go in peace.